Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to the third virtual Palm Beach International Equestrian Center educational series presented by Adequan here at the Winter Equestrian Festival for week three. My name is Miranda Tiona and I am happy to return for the 2021 series as the educational series coordinator. I am delighted to virtually spend the remaining 10 weeks with you every Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to learn. We had another exceptional turnout last week with 22 countries represented over four different continents with viewers joining from all over the entire continental United States. So thank you all for your participation and we are very glad to continue virtually during these COVID-19 pandemic times. For those of you who are not able to join these last few weeks, I'll briefly go through some, um, some functionality so you know how to engage with us. If you have any questions for the speakers at any time, please utilize the Q&A message center at the bottom of your screen. It should be a little icon that says Q&A and that's where you can type in your message at any time. The speakers will try their very best to answer all of your questions, but if for whatever reason they're unable to because of time, um, feel free to email me and I'll be sure to get you an answer directly. Lastly, I would like to say a huge thank you to Karina Brez Jewelry for providing a luxury item being a limited edition light pink diamond 18 karat rose gold horseshoe necklace valued at $3,000 for the grand prize giveaway. For every session that you attend, which we can see the stats, you get one entry. The winner will be announced April 1, and you do not have to be in attendance. We will simply be emailing the winner with the email that you registered with. So hopefully you check that. <laughs> now, with all that said, let's begin. I am delighted to introduce today's topic and speakers. Today's educational series session is sponsored by Spy Coast Farm, and the topic is Breeding the Sport Horse Mare challenges and advanced reproductive techniques. We have two excellent speakers for you today, our first being Dr. Modesty Burliston. She grew up in York, Pennsylvania and started riding when she was six years old and got her first pony at the age of nine. She knew at an early age that she wanted to be an equine veterinarian and that this passion and desire further cemented under the tutelage of their Dr. William J. Solomon at Pin Oak Lane Farm in New Freedom, Pennsylvania. Every summer and school break was spent with Doc furthering her passion for the thoroughbred and breeding industry. Dr. Burleson earned her bachelor's degree from Virginia Tech in animal science and rode on the intercollegiate equestrian team. She attended the University of Pennsylvania School of Veterinarian Medicine, followed by an ambulatory internship in Lexington, Kentucky at Rudin Riddle Equine Hospital under Dr. Tom Riddle. After her internship, Dr. Burleson stayed with Rudin Riddle as an associate and resident veterinarian for Shadwell Farm owned by Sheikh Hamden. In 2010, Dr. Burleson was hired by Lisa Laurie to become the resident veterinarian for Spy Coast Farm in Lexington, Kentucky. She has worked alongside Lisa to help build Spy Coast Farm into one of the world's leading warm blood uh, I'm sorry, more, yes, warm blood facilities specializing in the breeding and development of top quality sport horses. Dr. Burleson is married to Lynn Burleson and has two sons. Together, they own Burleson Farms in Midway, Kentucky, a commercial thoroughbred brood mare operation breeding over 100 mares each year. Her hobbies include family, fox hunting, gardening, chickens, and needlepoint. Our next speaker today is going to be Dr. Mariah Schnobrick. She grew up in Boston, Massachusetts, where visits to her grandparents' farm and riding lessons at a young age sparked her interest in horses and large animals. Her desire to become an equine veterinarian was cemented while volunteering at Tufts Large Animal Hospital during college summers. Dr. Snowbrick was a first team All-American rower in college and a member of the 2003 U23 US national team. 
She attended the University of Pennsylvania Veterinarian School, followed by an internship at Rood and Riddle Equine Hospital under Dr. Tom Riddle. She then completed a second year as a resident veterinarian at Shadwell Farm. Dr. Schnobrick finished her residency in large animal um, theriogenology at the University of Pennsylvania in 2012, where she was awarded the William B. Boucher Award for Outstanding Teaching at the New Bolton Center in 2012, as well as the 2012 Charles W. Raker Award. Dr. Schnobick is a diplomat of the American College of Theriogenology. Dr. Schnobick, since 2012, has worked as a theriogenologist at Root and Riddle Equine Hospital with a primary focus on the problem mare and stallion. She practices in both ambulatory reproduction and advanced reproductive techniques. She has been involved in several research projects in collaboration with other colleagues, both locally and nationally. And her particular interests are diagnostic methods for the problem mare, enhancing reproductive success in the mare and the stallion, and evaluating field data to assess practices that enhance reproductive efficiency. Dr. Schnobrick is married with three children, McPherson, Patrick, and Peter, and lives on a farm in Lexington, Kentucky. Her hobbies include spending time with family and friends, accumulating random animals and chickens, gardening and drawing and painting. It's also fun to, very, to note that they are both very close friends and have been friends for over 15 years. They both graduated from UPenn Vet School, worked as interns under Dr. Riddle's tutelage, became resident vets for Shadwell Farms, and then remained in Kentucky, got married, and had boys. <laughs> so it's really great that they can now continue their long journey as friends with us together in um, introducing a very interesting topic and presenting on this excellent topic. Now, without further ado, I would like to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Mar Modesty Burleson, to turn on her camera and begin prepping her presentation. All right, I just would like to thank everyone for allowing us to have this opportunity to present about breeding the sport horse mare. This is a very exciting topic to both Mariah and I. We've spent our whole careers um, in, indulging in it and um, glad that we can share it with you today. So the typical phone call that I get on a daily basis is someone calls and they say, so I wanna breed my mare. Now, this is not just picking the best baby daddy for your mare in the backyard. There's a whole lot that can go into this decision. We first have to look at the mare's pedigree. We look at her past performance history. We need to look at her confirmation and her technique if she's a show jumper going over the fences. Then that helps us go and decide what is gonna be the best stallion for this mare. We also have to take into consideration her age. Is she a young maiden mare or is she an older mare that's never had a foal before? This is gonna lead us into what semen options that we have. Are we gonna pick fresh, cold, chilled semen or are we gonna use frozen semen? And then one of the most important things is, you know, we have to work around the mare's schedule. Is she competing? Is she an FEI? Is she gonna be going back and forth overseas to show in Europe? Is she in the rehab um, with an injury and you know maybe they're stuck in a stall for six to nine months and can't move around or is she retired? That leads us into the next decision of is she going to carry a foal or are we going to do an advanced reproductive procedure such as embryo transfer or ICSI, which we will discuss at the end of this um, slideshow. So no matter what, the reason that I think that breeding and repro is so much fun is because we take all these bits and pieces and put together the puzzle, but we're all getting the same end goal of getting a healthy, viable athlete on the ground. But the fun part is trying to navigate all these different pathways to get there. So we have to take into consideration time, costs for the client, veterinarian availability, and then depending on your location, you know, are you gonna have the um, opportunities available to you to do certain procedures with your mare? So that's why we develop an individualized breeding plan for every single horse. So we start every exam with a breeding soundness exam. So what is that? Basically, it allows us to look at the mare and decide what is her reproductive potential for success or failure. We don't want to set our setup our we don't want to set ourselves up for failure in the beginning 
by trying to breed an old mare that's never had a foal with poor quality frozen semen, it's just not gonna be a good um, end result. We also do BSCs for a pre-purchase exam if the mare has any prospective broodmare value. And then the other reason is just to evaluate the typical problem mares that have a history of subfertility and infertility. So I'm gonna walk you through all the standard parts of the breeding and soundness exam one by one. So we first collect a detailed patient history. We need to figure out obviously the mare's age and then we wanna see, you know, has she had any foals before? It's very common for um, young mares as three and four year olds to either do embryo transfer in Europe before they start their show career or even carry a foal. So that's helpful information if they've had a cervical tear or any damage to the reproductive tract when we get them as 17 and 18 year old mares to breed. Then we do a general, a general physical exam. We look at the external genital, genitalia. We do palpation and ultrasound per rectum. And then we do culture cytologies and look at the cervix. So to get started, we have to first look at the whole horse. The most important thing as is the reproductive tract is an accessory sex organ. So if a mare is too skinny, or if she's unsound, lame and painful, the first thing to shut down is the reproductive tract. On the flip side, a mare that's obese can also have issues having a very normal estrus cycle and they can have metabolic disease, which would cause them to be, um, have an increased chance of immune suppression, which would cause chronic infertility. Next is the perennial confirmation. This is looking at the external genitalia of a horse. So whoever decided that it was a good idea when they made the mare to put the anus above the vulva was not thinking correctly. <laughs> so here you can see the perennial conformation is the perineum or muscles between the anus and the vulva and they should be straight up and down. Mares that are skinny or that have had numerous folds, everything gets pulled forward and is saggy. And so if they don't have a caslix, which I'll discuss in the next slide, they're basically contaminating and pooping right into their vulva, which gets aspirated in through the uterus and causes inflammation and chronic bacterial infections. So when you have this poor confirmation, it then can lead to secondary issues such as urine pooling, which you can see on the second slide. There's a vaginal speculum in there and it's basically just pouring urine onto the floor because the mare is accumulating it from a saggy uterine confirmation. And then this third image is of urine sediment due to vulvar discharge. So what is a caslix? I'm sure most of you have heard this term and wonder what in the world it is, but it's basically a very simple surgical procedure that's been done for over 90 years and was developed by Dr. Caslix when he noticed that there was negative impact for air to be sucked into the reproductive tract. This is an example of how you do a caslix, we do it standing. Most of the time the mares don't even need sedation. If you were to suture the vulvar lips without making a small incision first, it would not stay together. So we do a very simple lidocaine line block on each side and you wanna bring it closed down to the pelvic inlet. And then we do a simple forward interlocking suture pattern to bring it all closed. And 10 to 14 days later, you can remove the sutures. Anyone that's been brought up under the tutelage of Dr. Riddle, we start at the bottom and sew upward instead of top to bottom. This gives you the most beautiful apposition of the vulvar lips. <laughs> <laughs> Next, we go on to rectal palpation and transrectal ultrasound exam. So first, you wanna manually palpate the cervix, the uterus, and the ovaries. If the cervix is long and tight, it's normally a sign that progesterone is present and the mare is not in heat, but you can be fooled by old maiden mares that have never had a foal because they can have a long fibrotic cervix even in heat, which is a reason why they tend to have a lot of uh, uterine fluid clearance issues with their uterus. The uterus you palpate for pregnancy you always want to confirm pregnant or not pregnant before doing any advanced procedures on a mare. And then you palpate the ovaries for um, follicle size and structure and the abnormal masses. Next, you do your ultrasound exam transrectally. 
And here you can see much more than you can feel by doing ultrasound. Here's an example of a uterine cyst up in one of the uterine horns. You can see fluid on ultrasound and air. You can identify ovarian structures. And then here is another uterine horn showing big folds of edema. So we grade edema from um, zero to three. Zero, they'd not be in heat, and three, they'd be in a good heat, ready to breed. And then finally, we can diagnose pregnancy via ultrasound. So this whole part here is the uterine horn, and this is a 14-day pregnancy, a perfectly round ovarian or a perfectly round fluid-filled structure with the two hyperechoic lines. Next, we move on to the culture and cytology. So many of you have probably seen this weird silver magical wand and wondered what in the world vets do with it. Well, my kids think they're lightsabers, but it is actually a disposable vaginal speculum that we insert into the mare's vulva and use a pen light or a flashlight to look at the cervix. So here looking down this dark rabbit hole is the picture of the mare's cervical Oz. And so what we're looking for is color, how open it is. If a mare is out of heat, it will be closed tightly like a rosebud and lifted off the vaginal floor. And when she's in heat, it's wide open and flaccid and flat on the vaginal floor, ready for breeding. So once we decide if she's ready for um, a culture when she's in heat, we will pass one of these double guarded culture swabs through the vaginal speculum, trying to stay as sterile as possible and stick it right through the, the cervical Oz. This is the one that I typically use and you pass it into the uterus and then you push the cotton swab forward to pop this little cap off. And then you twist your cotton swab around and then you pull that back through and then you twist the entire culture around to fill that cap full of fluid. And that's what you tap on your cytology slide to make your smear. So you plate your culture swab at the lab and see what kind of bacteria you might be growing to decide if she's infected or not. And then you also make a cytology slide to look for endometrial cells, bacteria may be present, and then inflammatory cells such as white blood cells would show us different degrees of inflammation. So another good way of diagnosing fungal infections, because they're very hard to grow on um, bacterial plates, is you can actually see the hyphae and the yeast on a cytology slide, which can be very helpful. So once you have all this information, you still have many mare challenges ahead of you. So number one is age. Breeding a young fertile mare is much easier than breeding the older maiden mare that's never had a foal. Next is you wanna get the whole history. Is she had a foal every year and need a break? Is she a young maiden mare that's you know, never had any issues? Then you wanna assess her overall uterine health you can do biopsies to look for fibrosis. They may be reduced placental attachment. We can look at endometritis, uterine cysts, and then also metabolic disease. So here are some biopsy examples looking at the uterine health of a mare's endometrium. This first one is a relatively normal biopsy showing a few white blood cells, but normally a relatively um, normal degree of inflammation. Here, you can see this big cluster of black dots, which are white blood cells, also known as neutrophils. And this would be qualified as severe inflammation. So this mare is gonna have a much harder time getting pregnant or even maintaining the pregnancy. And then this third slide shows a biopsy of a mare's endometrium with a big fluid filled gland. And she's having trouble clearing fluid because the glands are not working properly and this mare too will have trouble um, maintaining pregnancy. Another very common um, issue that we have with older mares are intrauterine cysts. They can come in all shapes and sizes and they're fluid filled hyperechoic structures that you see in the mare's uterus. Sometimes they can look exactly like a pregnancy. Some are big and multiloculated. And the picture, this is what they look on the ultrasound in a uh, uterine horn. And then this is what it looks like on an um, endoscopy or hysteroscopy, which I'll show you next. And so 
These can be removed either manually or doing surgical laser ablation, but they typically always come back. Um, if they're really big and the mare's having problems maintaining pregnancies, then we'll go in and remove them, um, lavage her and clean her up for a cycle or two, breed her, and then just deal with them after she falls on the next year. So this is a really cool video of a hysteroscopy. We basically inflate the mare's uterus to distend it so that we can pass an endoscope through the cervix into the uterus and see what's going on. So in this bottom left corner, that's a huge cyst protruding. Oh no, come back. We'll do it again. <laughs> protruding into the mare's uterus. And then you'll see in a second, we had already popped one and this yellow thick honey fluid is just laying at the base of that right there. That yellow fluid is laying at the base of the horn. And so we're getting ready to pop this other one right beside it using alligator forceps. And then we'll just lavage the mare for two or three days afterwards. And um, we actually bred that mare and she did get pregnant and she was 19. So like I said, if at first you don't succeed, there's always other options. Sometimes you have to pick a different stallion, maybe one that's younger with better semen quality. Sometimes you have to switch from frozen semen to fresh semen. And then sometimes you have to make a phone call to a friend <laughs> and do advanced reproductive techniques. So now I will turn it over to the esteemed Dr. Schnobrick to talk about <laughs> embryo transfer and ICSI. Do we break, do we break for questions? Or no? no, we're gonna do it at the end. Okay. Tell them questions at the end. Okay, perfect. I just clarified with Dr. Burleson, we're gonna do questions at the end of the PowerPoint. So thank you again um, for having both of us speak. We're really excited and thank you, Dr. Burleson. <laughs> um, all right, so once you've decided um, and Dr. Burleson covered some of the issues with um, regular just breeding, sort of the things that you think about, I'm gonna talk about um, what are kind of the next steps and what are available to you as mayor owners for um, advanced reproduction. So you may be familiar with this in human medicine. This would be referred to as in vitro, um, in vitro fertilization, um, a surrogate mother and those kind of things. But we'll go into a little detail. I hope we can answer some questions and I look forward to the discussion afterwards. Um, so what are your options? So when you decide that you would like your mare to have a foal, you have basically three options. One is for the mare to carry that pregnancy herself. The other is for you to capture her genetics and then put it with the stallion that you've picked into a surrogate or a recipient mare. And that's referred to embryo transfer. And then the third option, which we'll talk about why you would do this, is called um, oocyte aspiration in ICSI, which is basically the test tube baby, the Petri dish. We're taking the egg out of the mare, fertilizing it and putting it in a recipient. So I'm gonna go over these, not so much the mare to carry, but just sort of the pros and cons and things to think about as you're trying to decide what is the best option for you given your mare and your current situation. So this is, I have three boys, modesty is two. This is what I looked like at about seven months of gestation, this little angry Shetland pony. So there are a lot of reasons to have your mare carry. There's certainly a great genetic match to carry the pregnancy, but um, it's a reduced cost. It's maybe the experience of motherhood, but one of the things that we certainly hear in the sport horse um, world and in other um, breeds that are using advanced reproduction are there are some disadvantages. If you have a very valuable mare that's being been incredibly successful. You don't want to lose competition days, but want to capture her genetics. The other thing is the act of foaling itself is not a completely benign process. Things can happen. Your mare may be at risk for having a dystocia or a difficult delivery, and there's no guarantee that it's going to be a as easy as her getting a Coggins drawn, okay? She's gonna have major changes to her body and there are some dangers associated with foaling to the mare. And it may be impractical. You may not be set up to foal a mare. That may not be something that you necessarily wanna do. Um, so if you have decided that for whatever those reasons are, you do not want your mare to carry, um, the, uh, the first option that becomes available is embryo transfer. And what does that mean? What it means is that you're gonna take your mare and you are gonna breed it to a stallion that you've selected, 
Okay, so here we have your mare and your stallion that you've picked, you are going to breed her. So she may be in competition, but you are going to have to follow her and actually inseminate her with either frozen semen or fresh. Seven days after, seven to eight days after she ovulates, she will come in and have what is known as an embryo flush. And this is a really a non-invasive procedure. It's basically a uterine lavage because the equine conceptus comes down into the uterus about six days after ovulation. So we can recover this embryo. It's really cool. And it looks just like this little circular structure. This is an equine embryo. And this little gray area here is the inner mast cell that will go on to become the foal. Okay. So this will become the placenta. We could go into that. But anyway, this is the embryo. So we recover this. We put it in a tiny little straw and we run it over to, in our case, we're fortunate at Rudin Riddle because we have a large recipient herd. So we're going to put it into one of the recipient mares that we try to match to the donor. We implant that. Seven days later, we know if a pregnancy is established. And about 11 months later, the foal will come out hopefully, right? That's the, that's the game plan, okay? So that's embryo transfer in a nutshell. It's basically like a surrogate mother, but you need to flush the embryo out of you and put it into another mare. So what is it, what are kind of the success rates? How does this compare in terms of efficiency to a mare carrying? In general, we think for a young mare, and again, this is going to depend on the age of your mare, this type of semen that you're using, how old the stallion is that you're breeding to. Obviously, things get more complicated and less efficient the older the animal is. But in a young mare, if you bred her out in the field to a good stallion, about a 70% conception rate. That means at 14 days after breeding, about 70% of those mares are pregnant. So here we recover, if we breed your mare, Again, depends on the type of semen. Fresh, we usually get better results than frozen, but you're about a 50% chance that when you flush that mare seven days after ovulation, you are going to recover this conceptus, okay? Now, if the, if the mare's uterus is a hostile environment, you may have heard this as a reproductive <laughs> turn, but if it's... Um, Infl inflammation, like Dr. Burleson showed on that biopsy, or there's other factors. She's very overweight. She has a lot of systemic inflammation. You may recover a very poor quality embryo. So the quality of that embryo is going to dictate how well you do. A very good quality embryo or a grade one embryo should result in about a 60 to 85%, and we call those like a grade one, grade two transfer rate, which means that once we transfer them at about 14 days of gestation, they should be pregnant. And then assuming everything's fine, you would probably have about the reasonable same um, pregnancy loss, maybe a little bit more. So it's a reasonably efficient process in a mare that has a healthy uterus, that's young and that you're breeding to a stallion and you have a little bit of time to play with because remember that it's gonna take actually breeding the mare, so multiple evaluations. So what if embryo transfer is unsuccessful? So what are things that when Dr. Burleson gets the call and someone says, I wanna breed my mare and you say, don't even try embryo transfer. What I have here is a picture of a mare as Dr. Burleson showed you with the hysteroscopy, there were some lymphatic cysts and this is an image of a mare that has a uterine adhesion. So there are mares that their uterus is so hostile or their oviducts are damaged, or they're having abnormal ovulations because they're so overweight, or they've been on Regimate their entire show career and they have a very chronic endometritis that hasn't been diagnosed. Those uteruses may not be the best environment to produce an embryo. And so they may be hostile. So I say reproductive tract pathology, when Dr. Burleson or myself has worked on a mare for a number of you know, a number of cycles, we cannot get her cleaned up. Those aren't great embryos to recover. Um, also, the stallion may, may have passed away. We may only have one dose of frozen semen, and you don't necessarily want to breed a mare with this kind of reproductive tract pathology to that stallion. Um, so what are your options then? Let's say you have an older mare and you've tried ET, it hasn't worked, or based on her history, we're concerned. Well, we can bypass the entire uterus and oviducts and get straight to the eggs. And in this case, what we're talking about is really in vitro fertilization. And in the horse, it's, I'll just explain this. In humans and cattle, you can take sperm and eggs in a Petri dish and you can make a baby. 
in the horse because of the interaction between that oocyte, and there's a picture of it right down here, and the sperm, the sperm doesn't penetrate. So what they actually need to do is take the sperm and drill a hole and stick it into the cytoplasm of this oocyte. And that is called ICSI or intracytoplasmic sperm injection. So if you're wondering where that term comes from, it's because that egg is really, um, it's like a feminist and it's gonna need a little more force to become <laughs> fertilized, okay? I want you to think of it that way. So in this case, again, you're gonna have your donor mare and I should have put the stallion up here as well because we do not at this point freeze or vitrify oocytes. What the process, and here you can see me with like a Starbucks grit face, okay, doing an oocyte aspiration. We're gonna take your mare, it's a one shot deal. So she comes in one time, she'll come in here to the stocks and what I'm doing is in this procedure, you're gonna place an ultrasound in a needle and you actually take these eggs out of her ovaries. You don't touch the uterus, but you are going in with a large needle. So it's a little more invasive than that embryo transfer that we showed you. And we recover these oocytes. It's a difficult procedure to perform for any of those of you who have done this. Um, once we recover the oocytes, which can be done at any facility, for example, Dr. Walburn down in Wellington does this, and then she'll ship them just the same as I will up here in Kentucky to a facility where they will get fertilized. So these oocytes then go to what we would call an ICSI facility, and they're going to take the sperm from the stallion that you want and inject it into that oocyte. And then once that oocyte matures, and I'll go into that a little bit more, they're gonna transfer and it becomes an embryo. So after fertilization, it then needs to divide, the cells need to divide. You're gonna develop an embryo. And once that embryo is developed, you will transfer it into the recipient mare, the same as we did a little bit with the embryo as we discussed in the embryo transfer. This is a really geeky, geeky slide, but I include it because we're sort of, I'm sort of geeky. Dr. Burleson is sort of geeky. So basically there's two types of oocytes that you can recover. One is an immature or a mature. All this means is you're either taking a smaller follicle or a larger one that has undergone stimulation to ovulate. Either way, we ask, we take those eggs and we ship them and they undergo what's called maturation. So they start as having two chromosome copies and during maturation, they're gonna go down to one. Once they see that, which is marked by the extrusion of the polar body, they're gonna inject the sperm and that's fertilization. Then it takes seven days from fertilization, just as it would in the mare, to culture it into a blastocyst and then we transfer it into a recipient and then it's the normal progression of pregnancy. So what do you expect with ICSI? Is it the same as just a mare getting pregnant? Do we expect the same results? The answer is no. There's a lot of discrepancy in the literature about results. Um, and I would encourage you to have these discussions with Dr. Burleson, myself, or whoever your veterinarian is, because having reasonable expectations about these procedures is really important. And it is very dependent on the mare, the stallion, and a lot of other factors. But in general, for each follicle that we enter, we expect to recover 50% of the eggs. So if I, were, if I aspirate 10 follicles, I am expecting to get at least five. Usually we do better than that, but at least five would be kind of industry okay. Then you send to the ICSI facility and they're going to 60% of them should mature. Of the ones that mature and become fertilized, 20% will become blastocysts or embryos that you can transfer into a recipient. And then after that, there is more loss associated with an ICSI pregnancy than an ET or to carry. So that is important. Katrin Henricks, um, who was at Texas A&M and is now at UPenn, always says it takes eight oocytes roughly to make a foal. I think it really depends on the mare. There are mares that we aspirate that we get 30 oocytes and no foals. Mm -hmm. And there are mares that we aspirate six oocytes and get three. So there's a huge range, but these are important, I think, for you guys to see so that you know and you can ask these questions about the efficiency of what's going on. So just to review some of the advantages and disadvantages, both of these, the mare stays in competition. Um, for ET, it is a more non-invasive procedure. You're not actually putting a needle into the abdomen. And so I do think it's important for owners to realize 
Um, the, you know, the ICSI sounds great, but there, you know, there are some, it's a needle in the abdomen. It is more invasive than ET. And sometimes we do have mares get a little bit colicky afterwards or uncomfortable, which is understandable, just as in human fertility um, stuff. So um, in ET, you can recover multiple embryos, but within a year, if you were to have two mares, one doing ET and one doing ICSI, you could recover many more embryos from the ICSI in general, if things are going well. The disadvantage of ET is that it does require multiple um, evaluations. And if the uterine health or oviduct or overall reproductive tract health is not ideal, you're likely not gonna get as much, um, as the efficiency will be reduced. For, and it is for ICSI, um, the advantages would be that you can use less semen because you really only need one straw of frozen semen. Um, it's potentially one-stop shopping. I've heard people refer to it as that because if a mare's in competition, she can come in for one procedure and then go back rather than having your vet have to coordinate multiple checks, breeding, et cetera, et cetera. It does allow for more embryos in general. There is an increased cost to the procedure. And again, as I mentioned, it is a little bit more invasive. Um, I put up here some of the costs in general, embryo transfer runs you, and this is going to depend where you are, how your veterinarian does um, breeding contracts and all of that, but embryo transfer, taking home a recipient is going to cost you somewhere between six to eight, eight thousand dollars. ICSI will cost you about ten to eleven to twelve thousand um, dollars. So there is a little bit of an increased cost, but again, in some of these mares that embryo transfer is not an option, it may be something you want to do. So um, I don't have anything else. We can open up to questions. Okay. So you want to do Lisa Laurie's? Let's see. Lisa Laurie asked, I want to also ask about Regimate Depot, et cetera. So answer live, make sure everybody can hear us. Um, so yes, a lot of competition mayor show on Regimate. Um, one problem I see is that mares are never ultrasounded, cultured or checked, and they're just put on Regimate at any point in their cycle. So they may be dirty and then they're on this for months or years. And sometimes if a mare's not going right, we've actually found that they had um, an endometritis and they had a uterus full of fluid. And once we treated them and put in a Caslix, they were going much better. The other thing is if a mare is on Regimate and they decide to breed her, um, we ask them to leave her on Regimate till she ships up to us because you can actually program them to be perfectly in sync and ready to breed within five or six days after stopping Regimate. And then if mares show on depot, uh, typically takes almost 30 to 60 days for their cycle to be normal um, to actually breed them. Okay. <laughs> what is considered an old maiden mare? Um, so typically, okay. Um, one question here is what is considered to be an old maiden mare? So I would say, and you would probably agree that 10 to 13 and under would be a typical young mare. Mm -hmm. um, I would say 14 or 15 and older that have never had a foal fall into my older maiden mare category. Yep, I would agree. And, I, and I, one of the issues that we deal with, with if they've been on Regimate is that that cervix doesn't open well. So um, even though they haven't had foals, there can be some really um, detrimental changes to their uterus. So just because your mare has not had a foal, and I think in a lot of, um, a lot of breeders or people who are, um, you know, for warm bloods, they, they believe that if they have a young foal or they have a foal when they're young and then go into competition, those mares are actually preferable to a mare that's never had a foal because their cervix and her endometrium has sort of undergone some of these changes that actually make it a little bit more healthy. It's a definite misconception that if a mare has never had a foal, then her uterus should be pristine. But if she's 14 or 15 and been on regimate her whole life, she could have serious fibrosis and endometritis and you just don't even know about it. And she may not even be able to carry a foal. Mm -hmm. 
Do that sure. Um, okay. So we have a question that says, what sort of preparation hormone does the recipient mare need before getting the embryo? So that's basically what you're trying to do is have the recipient's estrus cycle mimic your donor mare. So some, when you have a large number of mares, what you do is you are evaluating maybe a hundred mares a day and the mares that line up naturally with your, with your mare would ideally be chosen. So we would like the only hormones really ideally that we would use would maybe be an ovulation induction agent. So your mare's in heat, we have an estrus mare in heat. When your mare ovulates, we would administer that recipient an ovulation inducing agent and she would ovulate one to two days later. And then she would be appropriate as a recipient. And we would transfer it from the donor mare's ovulation mm -hmm. seven to eight days later. So there are lots of different um, variations of that, but the overall idea is that you would have her mimic estrus. Now there are some um, times in which a recipient mare, you might give estrogen to try to mimic and that goes into a whole nother talk. But um, the idea is that we're trying to mimic exactly what the donor mare is doing and have her, the recipient maybe a day or two behind your donor mare so that the embryo gets transferred and has a chance to kind of say, whoa, I'm in a new environment, get itself comfortable and then grow. <laughs> okay, next question. I have a 17 year old mare. Is it safe to breed at this age? So we can't just take her age into consideration. Again, you have to look at the whole mare. Does she have a reproductive history? Has she had foals before or is she a maiden mare? Is she um, systemically healthy and is she sound? If everything else is normal, I would say absolutely because typically most show mares, um, once they're retired from the ring are between 15 and 17 until they even start their second career as brood mares. So yes. And depending on the mare, some mares will be bred up to 23 days. Um, um, let's see. Um, um, you pick. <laughs> yeah, you want to do this one? Sure. Um, one question is, is it better to breed a mare multiple years in a row or give them a year off in between? So that really depends on the mare and what the owner wants to do. I think as any veterinarian, you look at the mare and if she um, has fold and is very stressed by that, you would give her time. Um, so mares naturally can, most mares would be able to produce a foal every year, um, but some mares may not be able to do that. And that may be a significant stress to them. So it really is mare dependent. Um, let's see. Um, sorry, we're looking. So, and there's a couple questions about specific mares. Could I do this? Could I not? You know, what I would say is um, if you're, if you have questions, reach out to Dr. Burleson about your mare and, and, or your veterinarian, however, or myself, or, you know, in terms of some of these questions about your specific case, but really it's case by case, just like Dr. Burleson said. Um, Here's a good question I recently dealt with um, with one of my patients. How concerning is a mare which is presenting chronically dirty from urine pooling? Can they come back from this after an extension procedure? The answer to that would be um, normally yes. Um, I work a lot with thoroughbreds. So in thoroughbreds, they must be bred live cover and have their own foal. There is no option of embryo transfer or ICSI. So um, a mare that's urine pulling that we need to do it everything we can for them. If you leave the urine in there um, and when they're in heat, it's going to go into the uterus and just cause chronic inflammation. And then can, even though urine is sterile, it can lead to bacterial infections. So um, the urethral extension is a pretty straightforward procedure um, that can be done standing with sedation and um, post folding after they have a fold, they normally don't need to have it repaired. So yes, they can have this done and be um, reproductively sound. And I would also add that if it's after one month post folding and there's still urine pooling, you are really best to go ahead and get that procedure done. I can't tell you how many mares come to me that are two, three years barren, um, chronic uterine infections, and it's caused by this urine pooling. It can be a real problem in a lot of mares. 
Here's a great question. Okay. What do you look for in a quality recipient mayor? Yep. Dr. So, Schoenberg. yes. So this is this is hotly debated, and certainly as we've looked at um, in Europe, there's some great research on epigenetics and how important that uterine environment is to the fetus as it grows. So when you take an embryo of one genetics and put it into another, there's obviously going to be a lot of questions about what are the effects of that. It's very important. Obviously, you're hoping that that embryo is going to almost an identically matched in terms of size and health size. So the size of the recipient, even though we there's been kind of conflicting studies on it, you want a horse that's about the same size and make of the mare that you're, that's ideal of your donor mare. Um, ideally, they're the same breed. Um, there are some breeds that are similar. Um, managing a recipient herd and at Rudin Riddle, um, Dr. Brady Camp and Dr. Scoggin um, do a lot of trying to fit the mare to the recipient and the donor. And it's very tricky. You need to make sure that the mare is not overweight, doesn't have health issues. So evaluating the recipient herd and the screening that they do for your mare is incredibly important. Um, there's also been a lot of evidence that if you have a mismatch, a significant mismatch, um, that you can have some metabolic issues, you can have um, predisposition to insulin resistance um, and also OCDs. So it is important and it's something to talk about with wherever you're going to be transferring your recipient. And we're certainly used to handling those questions and we do our best to match them. It is, it is challenging and it is something that you wanna consider. Next question, I am going to personally thank Jacqueline DiCarlo, one of my first interns over 10 years ago from <laughs> Spy Coast Farm, New York. Shout out, Jacqueline. So what are the health benefits to breeding a two to four-year-old mare? So typically, two-year-old mares are not sexually mature yet, and we would generally wait till they're three-year-olds. Um, we have done this with some of the warm bloods. It's a common practice in Europe. They will start them uh, in their training process and then they will breed them as three-year-olds or four-year-olds to then foal as a four and five-year-old. And then once they're weaned, they will go back into training. Some people think that this has helped um, sort of their mental stability and it leveled them out hormonally. If it's a mare that comes from sort of a tough, hot breed mare line. Um, do you have any comments about other physical? No, I mean, I think they, you know, a lot of people think, oh, they're young, they're gonna be really fertile. Some mares are just not mature enough. I mean, you mm -hmm. would expect their fertility to be great, you know, a two-year-old mare, why not? But some of the warm bloods really do take a lot longer to develop. So I, again, I think it's an individual mare question. Mm -hmm. And then just to follow on that one, um, is there an ideal age to breed? or is it really dependent on the factors you mentioned? Yes, um, I mean, in the ideal world, they need to at least be sexually mature and, um, and you still want their oocytes to be functioning. So just like humans, their egg quality deteriorates as they get up to their 20s. So I'd say anywhere between four and 13 is amazing. Yeah, and the other thing to add to that is if the mare has undergone a lot of stress or has been, you know, sometimes we get, cases where some a mare's colicked and they're like, oh great, let's harvest oocytes. That may not be the best time, you know, just like in humans. And as Dr. Burleson said, you want them to be healthy. Reproduction is a luxury. So they really need to be in good health and not stressed to get optimal results. So it may not be so much an age issue as their overall health, but obviously they do after 19, 20, they do start to decline. You do start to see, see some major some issues and I would see even younger than that. Here's another great question that I get a lot. What is the likelihood of being able to do an ET or embryo transfer with my mare using my own recipient mare? So most of the time um, when people call and ask me this, when we flush an embryo from a mare, we call ahead to the recipient herds because they set up almost three to five mares per one embryo flush that they're anticipating because that recipient mare needs to be within one to two days of ovulation of the donor mare. And so you want to put that embryo when it comes time to placement in the best uterus possible. So they're checking 
three to five mares that are on your mare same cycle. And if anybody has even a touch of fluid or inflammation or even maybe not sound that day, they're not gonna pick that recipient mare. So if you only have one recip that's meeting the qualifications in your backyard and on the day of transplantation, she's got fluid or even went out of heat, then you kind of lost the window of putting that embryo somewhere safe. Um, yeah, and I, I would say, I, what we usually recommend if someone wants to use their mare is have us do an evaluation on her. I mean, if she's, you know, under 10 years of age and healthy, let us culture, make sure she's suitable and you can try to line her up and she may work out well, but you certainly wouldn't want to put all your eggs in that basket. You know, you definitely mm -hmm. having a backup plan so that if for some reason on the day of transfer, she doesn't look ideal, you're not going to lose that whole cycle, I would say. Okay, next would be... And any live questions? I don't know. We've got a bunch of them posted. Does fresh semen... Okay, so does fresh semen mean that it was recently collected versus frozen semen that was previously collected and, and stored? So yes, fresh cooled semen is collected um, in the stallion shed and then we add extender and it can be shipped overnight via FedEx and you breed the mare within 24 to 48 hours. And some fresh chilled semen actually can last um, and still be alive in the mare for four to, we have one sign that's so fertile, the mare ovulated 10 days later and got pregnant. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and then comparison, frozen semen, you collect the stallion and then you process it in a different type of cryo extender and then you freeze it in liquid nitrogen. And once it's frozen, it lasts forever until it's thawed again. And when you breed with frozen semen, you wanna breed right on top of ovulation within about a six to eight hour window. Yep, so, and it's important to know when you guys choose fresh or frozen semen to ask questions about it. Is this good quality semen? What have your pregnancy rates been with it? And to recognize that frozen semen may require many more veterinary checks because we do have to be right on top of ovulation. Um, let's see. Okay. Do you trans, one of the questions was, do you transfer only one embryo to the recipient mare at a time? Or in humans, do you transfer a couple and hope, hope one of them survives? So ideally, fortunately we don't, well, I don't know, fortunately or unfortunately, we usually don't recover more than one um, embryo in mares. Now, warm bloods and thoroughbreds are more likely to twin. Um, so we do have that situation in which often we'll have, we, if we know that the mare has had two ovulations, um, we will line up enough mares. We would never put more than one into a recipient because we're trying to maximize our success. And even though if they both took, you would have to eliminate one. So we don't want to be in that position. So we only transfer one as a rule and then make sure that we have enough recipients if we realize the mare has more than one ovulation. Um, let's see. Do you think more complicated processes like ICSI or embryo transfer have any effects on a foal in utero? Okay, so th this is a really good question and this comes up um, time and time again. And it's certain one of the big things too with ICSI is that you actually select the sperm that is gonna cause fertilization. And there's been a question of, are you producing equine athletes? And there is enough evidence, certainly from the large number of polo ponies, show jumpers, that the athletic capability um, is not hindered by the process. That being said, um, as we showed in the ICSI slide, there is more loss. So there's obviously some detrimental effect. Um, it's not as good in some cases as doing a live breeding, but if you have a 22 year old mare with a fibrotic uterus, that is the best you're going to get. And a lot of times these older mares do produce some excellent athletes. So um, I would say it's a complicated question with a lot of nuances, but I certainly was skeptical about it coming from a family of athletes myself. And um, what does that really do to the, you know, the vigor of the foal, but I think even they've shown with clones and Argentine polo ponies, I mean, these processes produce some phenomenal athletes. So I, I would not be concerned about that, but I think asking questions about the recipient herd and making sure everything's ideal is the best you can do. Okay, next question, ET versus ICSI. Is there a difference between the success of one versus the other? 
for early versus later in the breeding season? For example, doing one versus the other in February and July. Ooh, that's a good question. So that's a loaded question. <laughs> so for embryo transfer, you're actually putting semen into the mare. So she must be cycling and in heat. And since mares are seasonally polyesterous, they respond to daylight length. So their best time for breeding naturally or um, with fresh and frozen semen is going to be March, April, May. And then you can flush the embryo. Whereas ICSI, you can actually harvest immature oocytes year round. And historically, from my experience, when they're in, coming out of anestrus from the winter and they have a lot of little follicles, it seems like February, March is the best time that I've had the most success. And as I get later in the year and you've already bred that mare a couple times, it seems like the success rate goes down. Yeah, and, and it depends to where your recipient mares are. So heat stress, definitely becomes a factor in July. Some of the mares won't cycle normally. If the temperatures are too hot, you may have hemorrhagic follicles. So really as close to the breeding season as possible, just like Dr. Burleson said, um, you know, for ET and then oocyte aspiration, you really can do year round. Um, so let me see. Okay. We've got a couple other ones. Here is an excellent question from Becky Gilchrist. What management tactics can someone do to help improve their mare's egg quality? Good. Do you want to do it? You want me to do it? Go ahead. <laughs> um, so this is a really good question. I think just as uh, shown in the slide, overall systemic health is incredibly important. Your mare needs to be a good, healthy weight, a body condition score where you can um, six, seven, you can see some ribs. You don't have a big fat neck crest and a crease going down the back because they've shown that overweight mares have increased inflammation. Um, certainly insulin resistance can actually have very detrimental effects on oocyte quality, which we know from other species as well. So the biggest thing is looking at your mare, making her as healthy as possible. Once you've done that, there are supplements that have been there's some research to show that they help improve oocyte quality, maybe by the fact um, the mitochondrial activity in the oocyte. Um, and there's a bunch of them. I'm not gonna name them now unless you really need them. But um, I think the biggest, you know, ask your veterinarian, ask your repro vet what supplements they recommend. Um, and I would say just the biggest thing is that overall systemic health. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love Love this question. Is it better to wait to do the reproductive soundness exam after weight loss of a mare that wintered out too heavy, or is it still okay to start checks with a weight management workout plan set? That's like shopping for your bikini <laughs> before you sign up for the gym. <laughs> The Monday diet. <laughs> no, the reproductive exam can be done anytime. It's best to be done when the mare is cycling and in estrus so that you can get your culture and cytology. And while you're doing this reproductive exam, your veterinarian can look at the overall health of your mare and make recommendations, whether she does need to lose some weight, you know, you can get your culture, get her cleaned up and put the Caslix in so that you're not waiting an extra three months while she's still dirty. So I think that's a great question. Yeah. And, and I would not hesitate. If you think you're going to breed your mare, you want to look because the other thing is you may look and find a pathology that makes it that you're not going to breed her. And you'd rather know that than spend all the effort. Um, yeah, I agree. Okay. Um, let's see. If you get more than one embryo, but you only want one full a year, are you able to freeze the extras? Uh, the answer to that question is yes. So you cannot freeze equine oocytes or eggs, but you can freeze the equine embryo. Um, and this is a common practice and is becoming more increasingly yeah. done in the United States. Yep. So, I mean, there are mares that we do oocyte aspirations on now and vitrify or freeze those embryos, wait until February 14th and transfer them. And then they'd be getting fold in January. So that's something you certainly can do. Um, and, and is, um, a very reasonable option. So here is a question. Why can't thoroughbreds do embryo transfer or ICSI? So a thoroughbred mare could have embryo transfer or ICSI done if you were breeding to a warm blood stallion and wanted to register in a warm blood registry. But if you were trying to register this thoroughbred with the jockey club as a racehorse, they do not allow embryo transfer or ICSI. It must be live cover. And this all goes back to supply and demand 
for um, stallions. It would drive down the stud fees of um, the valuable stallions that we have. Um, there is frozen semen. Is freezing a mare's egg a thing in case of wanting to breed her later in life? Um, you would love to, but at this time we're not freezing um, the eggs. But um, it does bring up another what harvesting over that. Yes, I was going to say. So there's two things that I would mention that we didn't go over, but let's say you have a mare that is sick for some or reason colics. or colics mm -hmm. and you absolutely love this mare and you can't imagine losing her and you're faced with that terrible situation. You can, if you can pick a stallion quickly, you can, you can ask them to harvest her, her ovaries and send them to a facility where they can take her eggs and undergo ICSI. So if you ever have one of those situations, I hope you don't, you can certainly take um, remember that you can harvest those genetics, but you will have to pick a stallion. Now you could, if you get 30 oocytes, which you may get, you could breed to three different stallions and potentially have a few embryos from different stallions. And the same goes for stallions. I think I've mentioned in um, some other talks that we've given that you can, if you're castrating a stallion, freeze the semen. So sometimes we get requests for that as well. Um, okay. At what age is peak fertility? I'm starting to think 40. I'm <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Sorry, we sometimes can be inappropriate. It's okay. um, <laughs> mare fertility. Mare fertility would be between um, three and. Yeah, I would say three and nine. Three, three to three. ten. In yeah. a warm blood, it's older. So, like different ages. And, and like a Shetland pony, I think their fertility is like two to 24. <laughs> so, it just depends. But uh, honestly, in that six, seven range is really a pretty nice spot for a warm blood. So semi-breed specific, but for the most part, yep. six to nine. Yep. Um, here you go. This is a good one. How popular is ICSI becoming compared to embryo transfer? We have seen at Root and Riddle a large increase in demand for oocyte aspiration. And in talking to places like Rob Foss, Equine Medical, um, they are, last year they saw more cases than they saw before, even with COVID. So it is becoming a more widely accepted procedure. And I think a lot of that has to do with the convenience of show mares because you have such a limited schedule. You wanna be able to drop your mare off, have the procedure done and not have to think about it. So it is increasing. Um, and I think, again, the decision of which one is best for your mare is really dependent on the time that you have, the age of your mare, and many of the factors, really, that goes into making the best breeding plan. But it is definitely becoming more popular, more efficient, and a more widely accepted way to produce a folk. Um, I think we've gone over it. I, I think know. we've done um, most of these questions. Yep, there's a couple comments here. But anybody else have any questions? We're here all day. <laughs> Call anytime. <laughs> yep. <laughs> all right. I'd like to thank Dr. Mariah Schnobrick and Dr. Modesty Burleson for an excellent presentation. And of course, thank you to Spy Coast Farm for your very generous sponsorship. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And I would like to say to please join us next Thursday for more continued learning at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for WEF Week 4, which that topic will be a deep dive into equine gastric ulcer syndrome sponsored by Platinum Performance. Don't forget to register directly on the PBIEC website to secure your spot and to count as one entry for the grand prize giveaway from Karina Brez Jewelry. Thank you very much. Again, speakers, excellent. And Spy Coast Farm, I hope to see everyone next week for another very informative session. Have a great evening and goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>